Hello fellow video game collectors. Today I want to talk about the games that I finished in 2016. So earlier in 2016 Nintendo released Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow on the 3DS eShop for the Pokemon's 20th anniversary. So I hadn't played through my copy of Pokemon Blue since I was a kid so I just had to get these. So I played through Blue earlier in the year uh, then I r recently decided to get on this Pokemon kick and I just started playing through all the Pokemon games. So I went ahead and also got Pokemon Yellow on the Virtual Console and beat it and it was my first time playing through Pokemon Yellow as well. This was just a huge nostalgic kick to the face. I absolutely loved getting to play through Pokemon Blue again. It just made me incredibly happy to be able to relive that childhood experience again. And since I've been playing through all the Pokemon games, I finally got a copy of Pokemon Crystal and I played through it for the very first time as well. I have no idea why as a kid I only got and played Pokemon Blue and no other games in the series until the more recent Pokemon X and Y. But I love this game. Uh, it's such a great improvement over the original first Pokemon generation of, of Blue, Red, and, and Yellow. Um, you know, it was just great to see everything in full color uh, on a Game Boy game. I just thought it was very well done. I just really wish that I was able to play this game as a kid when it first came out. I just really think that would have been awesome. But I did love the fact that in this game, uh, once you beat it, you're able to go back to the region of, uh, from the first generation games, from, from Blue, Yellow, and, and Red. Uh, I just thought that was a really cool thing that they added in, into this game. And that's why uh, it's a little bit more sought after, uh, this one and, and the uh, remakes of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, because it just has so much content for you to play through. So the next game I beat was Life is Strange. Uh, so this game actually came out in early 2015 and it was quite popular at the time, but I didn't get around to getting a copy of this game until it went on sale uh, earlier in 2016. But I did manage to get it for a great price, and that was with this limited edition, which comes with like a, an art book and a, a music CD of the game. So if you're not familiar with it, this game plays a lot like uh, the Telltale Story games, uh, which is another series of games that I really like and enjoy. Uh, you walk around, you talk to people, you interact with things. It's pretty much a simple and straightforward point and click adventure game. Um, but it also has this really nice twist where you're able to rewind time which allows you to change your mind on uh, pretty much any decision that you make in the game. So you can decide on doing option A and if you don't like that you can rewind it and see how option B works. And then you can rewind it again and decide to go with your original option which I thought was a really cool feature and something that you really need in a game that plays like this. I also found it to be a really moving game. The story was really interesting and it had quite a few unexpected turns. Uh, I simply could not put this game down and my fiance wouldn't let me put it down either because she really enjoyed watching me play this game. Uh, she was really interested to see you know, what was coming next, what was going to unfold next in the story. Um, so definitely check this game out if you're a fan of the Telltale games. So next is Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, I took a break from Assassin's Creed for a while. Uh, I really enjoyed Black Flag a lot. That's probably my favorite game of the entire series. But the yearly releases of the Assassin's Creed games just really started to drag me down. So it wasn't until earlier in the year that I actually sat down and finally got around to beating Unity. When this game first came out, it was just a terrible, terrible buggy mess. Uh, a lot of those issues were patched and fixed later, but it's still a pretty buggy game in general. Uh, it's playable, um, you know, it's nothing really game breaking anymore, um, but it's definitely not the most polished Assassin's Creed game. I think the most interesting thing about this game that I really liked was the multiplayer co-op story missions. It was something that hadn't been done before in this series, and it's something that I actually would love to see again. Uh, I was initially really excited about the French setting of the game because I'm someone who really likes uh, things about France and uh, I love to learn to, and speak the French language. But I was really sorely disappointed 
uh, with the voice actors that were chosen for this game uh, because everyone just sounds like they're, they're British, English, and it just really broke the immersion of the game for me. Overall though, uh, this wasn't my favorite game in the entire series, but it also wasn't the worst. Uh, that would be reserved for Assassin's Creed 3. So then that leads me on to Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Uh, so this game, it's set in London, uh, and I think the atmosphere and everything of that nature in the game it was really well done. You definitely feel like that you were there. I also really liked the idea of having two different assassins that you could play in this game and I liked how Ubisoft tried to differentiate between the two by giving them uh, slightly different skills. You know, one has these skills and one has the other. But in the end, it still felt like that they were uh, still way too similar to each other that it really didn't matter which assassin that you decided to play as uh, during the missions throughout the game. This was also the first Assassin's Creed game in some time to not include any sort of multiplayer features, uh, which was actually fine by me because uh, I usually just play the Assassin's Creed games uh, for the, the stories, um, aside from Unity. But Unity was special because um, the missions that you played in Unity were uh, story missions. It wasn't like a, a completely separate multiplayer feature, you know, like, uh, quick play games. Instead, it was you and a friend actually playing missions as a part of the game. In the end though, I really felt like the story of the game, especially the final boss, reminded me way too much of Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, just way too many similarities. Plus, the series has sort of been off the rails since Assassin's Creed 3, when the main protagonist of the entire Assassin's Creed series was killed off. And Ever since then, it just, you know, it feels like the series has turned into more of a, you know, let's explore some specific place in a certain, in certain era of time, uh, open world simulator. So the cohesion between the games since Assassin's Creed 3 with that main protagonist has been lost. And I, I kind of think that's why Ubisoft decided to kind of take a break with this, with the Assassin's Creed series. And I think that's a really good thing. Releasing a new Assassin's Creed game every year, it just started to be too much of the same, especially with uh, no longer having a story progression between the games anymore. I mean, you still have little pieces here and there of the other um, side characters from the Assassin's Creed series, you know, still showing up here and there. But you just, you know, without having Desmond anymore, it, it's just not the same. So overall, I would still recommend this game in particular if you're a fan of the series. I really enjoyed my time with it. The next game that I got around to finishing was Fallout New Vegas. So for some reason, uh, when this game originally came out, uh, I think when I got first got it, I played it for like maybe one or two hours and then I just put it down, shelved it away. And it's really weird that I did that because I really, really enjoyed Fallout 3 to the point that I got every single achievement in that game, including getting every single one of the uh, bobblehead figurines, which was a huge pain in the butt to do, but I still did it. Now, I actually started this game back in 2015, last year, and I was trying to finish it before Fallout 4 came out, but I ended up not having enough time to complete it before then. So I picked it back up, uh, this year in 2016 and finished it then after I finished Fallout 4, which I'll get to here in a minute. So I really enjoyed this game. Now it's been a really long time since I've played Fallout 3, uh, something like seven or more years ago when it first came out. So I can't really remember a whole lot to, to compare this game uh, to Fallout 3, um, but I felt like that this game was just more open uh, especially with all of the decisions that you make in this game, there seems to be a um, more focus on the different factions of the game. And because of that, you know, it has just a greater impact on the different endings of the game, depending on, you know, who you decide to side with. And it was pretty hard ending some of those relationships towards the end of the game. So I didn't do a completionist run of this game like I did with Fallout 3. Uh, I haven't even decided if I want to, you know, go back and spend more hours, you know, collecting all the achievements uh, for this game. But I might, I might go back and, and do it in sometime in the future. Um, so 
overall, I will say that if you like Fallout 3, you need to play this game. It's definitely worth getting. And um, do remember that Fallout 3 and New Vegas are backwards compatible on the Xbox One. So just pop this disc in, it'll install it, and you can play it on your Xbox One, which I just think is an absolutely great new feature that Microsoft has done with the Xbox. So speaking of Fallout, like I mentioned earlier, I did finish Fallout 4 as well. Uh, again, this game did come out in 2015, but I just didn't end up really finishing it until 2016. But boy, did I put a lot of hours into this game. Uh, I did pretty much every single one of the unique quests in the game, uh, but I still do need to go back and try and get all of the other endings of the game. Now, I do have some mixed feelings about Fallout 4. Uh, it has some good things going for it and also some uh, not so great things. So things that I liked. Uh, the electric Chinese sword I thought was just simply badass. Uh, probably my favorite weapon of the game and I don't really care much about using melee weapons in these kinds of games. You know, if it's first person shooter I usually prefer using ranged weapons. Uh, with Fallout you have the option of using melee weapons but like in Fallout 3 and in New Vegas, I never use melee weapons, but in this one, that sword, it was just awesome to use. I also like that you didn't have to repair your uh, weapons and armor in the game, uh, aside from the power armor, which I was okay with. Um, and I really like that because that was one of the really big annoyances that I had with the other Fallout games, uh, 3 in New Vegas, is that you just constantly need to be fixing your gear because, you know, it's always being used if it's a weapon and, it, you know, the condition goes down or you're constantly getting hurt so your armor keeps going down. You know, it's just a huge pain in the butt to have to just constantly manage, you know, having, you know, five different copies of the same gun and having to always, you know, merge them together with your with your repairing to make, you know, to fix your weapons again and make them even better. Um, I also liked uh, all of the weapon and armor mods that they added in this game. You know, like I said, with the Chinese sword, it was electrified. I thought that was just awesome. Some of the quality of life features, like the uh, streamlined uh, looting of bodies and you know other containers in the game, you know, made Something that was previously a really big chore, uh, just so much easier to do because in uh, Fallout 3 in New Vegas, you know, whenever you looted something, it would pop up a, a new modal screen. And this one, you know, it's like you go up to it and it just kind of, you know, shows up. You know, it's just seamless interface. And I really enjoyed that because, you know, with games like this, you know, when you're constantly having to loot stuff and deal with inventory management, you know, that just becomes a huge pain in the butt. But probably the number one thing that I didn't like about this game was the changes that they made to the dialogue system. So for one, you don't really know what exactly your character is going to say. So it gives you these different options, but they're like very concise, summarized, and it doesn't give you the whole text that you're going to say. And for two, those dialogue options are exactly the same no matter what the conversation is. It's yes, no, sarcastic, and more information. Those are the only options that you get in Fallout 4, which I thought was a really big bummer because I missed all of those complex dialogue trees from the previous Fallout games, including the ones that were based on uh, skill checks. Overall though, it is a recommended game. Uh, I'm not really sure if I like Fallout 4 more or not than the other games in the series. You know, they each have you know their pros and cons. Um, you should still definitely uh, play it. Um, I still need to go back and play it again because I haven't tried um, the new mod system that you can even do on Xbox and I, I believe PlayStation 4 as well. Um, and I haven't uh, checked out any of the DLC yet. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to buy it or not. It looks alright. We'll see. Alright, next is Call of Duty Black Ops 3. So you might be seeing a theme here, but this is yet another game that came out towards the end of 2015 that I just got around to finally finishing this year in 2016 but that's mostly because uh, I got sucked into the multiplayer of this game before I got around to finishing completing 
the single player campaign. So I'm starting to feel a little bit mixed about the Call of Duty series as it keeps progressing more and more into the uh, futuristic style of, of warfare with you know robots and, and things of that nature. Um, I'm no die-hard Call of Duty player, but I do usually you know pick up uh, whatever version comes out you know every year. And recently, I've kind of been wishing that they would return to a more modern or maybe historic warfare setting. So this game seemed to adapt a lot of things that Titanfall uh, brought into you know the genre with jump packs and wall running. Uh, which were things that I liked in Titanfall and they also work pretty well in this game as well. Uh, but it also makes the game uh, a bit more twitchier uh, than the Call of Duty series used to be. I also really like the specialists that they added to the game in multiplayer with each one having their own unique ability which really helped diversify the monotony of the game some because you know most Call of Duties you know you just you have you know, you make a class of certain weapons that you like to use and you just pretty much use that the entire time. Uh, this, the specialist kind of helps spice that up a little bit. Although I've already went ahead and bought this year's Call of Duty uh, for 2016 being Infinite Warfare, um, I'm really starting to feel a little bit of a burnout on the Call of Duty series. Uh, similar to what I've been feeling to with Assassin's Creed. Although, um, I will say that Infinite Warfare um, has kind of changed my opinion of that a little bit uh, since since I have played this, um, but I'll get to that in the future whenever I talk about uh, Infinite Warfare when I beat it. Alright, next is The Division. So when this game first came out, I was super hyped for it. Uh, it's an online cover based shooter with lots of player versus environment and some player versus player combat which you know just all sounded great to me and it really was good um i really enjoyed this game from level one up to level 30 which was the level cap but once you hit that level cap the only thing left to do in the game was grind 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 and not a good kind of grind like destiny because the only way to get better gear once you get to the end game is to fight the monsters, well, monsters in the player versus player uh, section of the game, which was called uh, the Dark Zone. So there was this constant paranoia of not knowing whether or not uh, another group of agents would go rogue and gank you, you know, kill you, steal the items that you, you know, spent the last hour or two trying to get in the Dark Zone. I mean, that gameplay uh, element was, was okay on paper, but after a while it just kind of got really boring. Which is really how the game killed it for me. I don't know, it's just the uh, lack of in-game content. I, I think that's what killed this game. Uh, the game had this huge player base when it first came out, and then within a few months, you know, everyone hit the level cap, they got bored, and they moved on and you know their player base just dwindled to nothing and i do know that they have done some updates to the game since then and they've kind of fixed some of those issues but it just has zero of my interest now and you know i just think that they were way too late to fix the game because by the time that they even started talking about fixing the game everyone already left but that is not to say that this is a bad game i really 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 did have a you know really good time uh, and a fun time with this game going from level 1 to level 30. Um, I really wonder if this game would have just been a lot better if uh, Ubisoft decided to you know focus stay focused more on the uh, campaign content you know the player versus environment content than uh, the end content that we got with the dark zone. Um, I think it probably would have done a lot better. And then speaking of grindy looty uh, games, uh, I also finished uh, Borderlands The Handsome Collection. Uh, this includes both Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel. So you know, I picked up this two pack for the Xbox One and um, I've actually never played a Borderlands game uh, before this one. I, I never played the original one. So I ended up playing through both of these games with my friends online with the co-op 
uh, and we had a lot of fun with it. It was just a blast to play. Uh, the art style, the humor, the gameplay, you know, everything was just, you know, it was great. There's a lot of quests to do in the game, and I found the story of Borderlands 2 to be pretty good. But on the flip side, uh, I really didn't care too much for Borderlands, the pre-sequel, uh, other than being able to play as, you know, the most awesome Claptrap, uh, who has some of the most ridiculous and sometimes annoying, yet fitting his character uh, abilities in the game. And I really thought it was hilarious that, you know, whenever you choose him as a character, the game asks you like three times, are you really sure that you want to play as Claptrap? The pre-sequel just didn't feel as fleshed out to me uh, as Borderlands 2. Uh, it really probably should have just been an add-on uh, to Borderlands 2 instead of being a standalone game. Uh, I, I find it really hard to describe, you know, why it feels so different. It's just missing that magic that uh, Borderlands 2 had that made it such a great game. Still though, uh, these games, you know, they're really great, uh, if you're, especially if you're looking for a solid co-op game to play with some of your friends, you know, first person shooter, loot driven, you know, it, it gets really high recommendation from me. Now, these aren't all the games that I finished in 2016. Uh, but for sake of brevity of, of this video, um, that's all I'm going to talk about for today. Uh, I will have a part two coming up soon, so be sure to look out for that. Um, now, as always guys, thank you for watching. Uh, be sure to give the video a thumbs up as that always helps me out. Leave a comment down below. Tell me what games uh, you managed to finish in 2016. And if you're new to the channel, then be sure to subscribe. And remember, you gotta get the power up to beat the game.